the Wellbeing for Real Life podcast. Welcome to Wellbeing for Real Life. Today we're talking about sleep. I'm Dr. Richard Pyle, GP with a special interest in cardiovascular and lifestyle medicine. Um, my guest on the show today is Dr. Asim Malhotra. Asim, good morning. Good morning, Richard. How are you? I'm doing very well, thank you. Asim, rather than have me introduce you, could you just tell us briefly a little bit about yourself? Yeah, I'm a consultant cardiologist. Um, I qualified in 2001 from Edinburgh Medical School. Uh, so I've been practicing you know, in medicine now for almost two decades. Uh, I have a special interest in lifestyle medicine and in, in prevention. I'm also a visiting professor of evidence-based medicine. Uh, and uh, my personal mission is to save a million lives. Um, sorry, sorry. <laughs> My personal mission is to save lives a million at a time. Okay. And uh, that's a very impressive personal mission. Yeah, well, I think, you know, it's, uh, it's, a, it's something just to aim for, you know, and hopefully we'll, we'll save a few lives on the way. Absolutely. And one of the, the things that we're going to be talking about today is sleep, which obviously uh, is a pretty important thing when it comes to saving lives. Um, uh, I just thought we could, if we could each start, we could describe maybe something that we're uh, really happy about with our sleep and maybe an area where we either struggle or would like to do a bit of improvement. Would you like to, to bear your soul and go first? Yeah, Richard. So I think actually, interestingly for me, you know, I'm somebody that uh, certainly tries to, and most of the time will follow my own advice. I think the one area which I probably can improve on is making sure I get good quality sleep. And, um, you know, uh, evidence does tell us, as you, as you well know this, that ideally we should all be getting at least seven to eight hours of good quality sleep a night. Um, it's very important for mental health, for physical health. Uh, it's, you know, the time when uh, a lot of the repair mechanisms of the body are going on. For me, I, I think that that's one area where I've not been very consistent. And um, I think most of it for me personally, is often things that are out of my control. So external stresses that then influence your sleep. So I try and make a habit of, uh, you know, the things I'm, I'm good at when it comes to sleep is I've got a very, um, uh, a very consistent routine in terms of making sure I go to bed early. I've always been someone that likes to go to bed early. Uh, certainly during the working week, I like to be in bed by sort of 9, 9.30 uh, at the latest. You know, I'll read, read before I go to sleep. Um, but, and, and falling asleep has never been an issue for me, but it's sometimes waking up in the night and often, you know, waking up in the night is related to the stresses of the day. I think mm. uh, one thing I've learned and something that, um, you know, other people can also think about is that, uh, if you're in an environment which is, um, relatively stress-free, then, uh, and that can even be, you know, being around people that you care about, or it can be that you're on holiday, you know, that your sleep generally certainly from my perspective is a lot better yeah absolutely uh, and and for me i find that um i don't have a problem with the, the quality of my sleep uh, when i've when i've had it measured with, with electronically uh, i sleep really well quality wise but i haven't always given myself the quantity and it sounds like you've you've got a good routine and that you often go to bed at a sensible time I, i've rarely ever gone to bed at sensible o'clock until right. Probably in the last, well, in the last three, four, five years where, you know, as part of my developing an interest in lifestyle medicine, I had to grudgingly concede that maybe I should be thinking a bit more about this and, and practicing what I preach. Uh, and having a wife that insists on going to bed early uh, has, has really helped me. I, I used to be slightly resentful of that. And now I find it really helpful. I look forward to my, to my bedtimes. Yeah. I, and I, you know, I find as well, uh, Richard, when I've had periods where, you know, I've been able to maybe go away, uh, you know, spend time with um, my extended family. Um, very quickly, it's interesting how I notice within the space of a few days, I'm suddenly waking up later. I've got a, you know, instead of waking up at, say, half, three or four a.m., I'm, I'm sleeping till six a.m. And, mm. and it's just amazing how, and, I, and the only change has been going to a, a, a you know, a more, you um, uh, a less stressful and so-called, I think, happier environment. You know, for me, I think it's slightly unique. Maybe everyone's different. I live on my own. Uh, and I think that for, uh, is probably uh, one of the downsides of living on, on, on your own is, for me anyway, is actually that in itself probably has some kind of impact on my sleep because mm. having people around you, even if you've got flatmates or whatever else, 
um, I think it helps build emotional resilience. And, uh, you know, I see that with other people, some of my patients, for example, as well. Um, you know, the, the, these, are the, these are the things that are really important. And, you know, moving on from that, what's really interesting and what I've learned, you know, just a couple of interesting anecdotes. Uh, some, some, you know, I'll name, there are certainly two very famous um, sportsmen. Uh, one being Roger Federer, as you know, the tennis player, who's probably one of the greatest ten tennis players of all time. And the other one is a basketball player in America called LeBron James. Huge, very, very famous, um, successful basketball player. And both of those individuals are very, very um, uh, proactive in telling people or explaining to people that one of the secrets to their success and longevity as athletes, as sportsmen, is the fact that they are obsessive about getting good quality sleep. So Roger Federer, you know, I read somewhere, claims that he actually gets 11 hours of sleep a day. And that's the reason he's still playing great tennis, you know. Uh, that's impressive. Still, at this, you know, uh, uh, you know, where most tennis players have retired, he's still playing, you know, fantastic Grand Slam tennis. And LeBron James says he will get at least eight to 10 hours of sleep a day. So get eight hours, you know, and he has discipline since when he goes to bed, etc. During the, during the nighttime, but he'll also have, um, he'll take two hours out of his day in the afternoon to have a nap. And, he, you know, so yeah. it's fascinating. I think it's something that we um, haven't focused on enough. And, and even if we're aware of it, we, a lot of people probably don't know, uh, or don't have the tools or don't have the, um, uh, the education, if you like, to try and improve their sleep, which obviously mm. is, you know, with, uh, which your book obviously mentions, uh, you know, quite extensively. Yeah, so, so those are really great examples of, of how sleep is, is performance enhancing. So if we take a step back a bit, um, look, should we talk a bit about what, what goes on in our brains when, when we're asleep? I think that could be quite helpful to give people an understanding of why it is that we're so uh, interested in this. Yeah, absolutely. From your perspective, why, why, Asim, Yeah, um, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing, yeah. uh, uh, hearing yeah. about that from you, Richard. Yeah, so... Uh, you know, whilst I don't consider myself a, an expert on sleep, it's it's very easy to to learn a lot about the benefits of it. Um, and and I think if you think about it, we've we spend about a third of our life asleep, and when we're asleep, we're effectively in a, a paralysed, um, vulnerable state. So either that's really really important for our our restoration, or it's a huge evolutionary mistake. And obviously, I think it's the the former rather than the latter. Um, and I used to imagine when I was younger and not so bothered that maybe, you know, not a lot happened when we were asleep. We were just really dormant. But actually, there's there's a lot that goes on. For example, our glial cells, um, which are cells within our brain, shrink. Uh, and so the flow of the cerebrospinal fluid through them increases, I think, by about 60%. And that means that you can clear away a lot of the, of the day's debris. Um, also, sleep's really important for um, consolidation of learning, and uh, and memories and there's good evidence to show that um you if you are sleep deprived then you can potentially forget 30 or 40 percent of of what you've learnt even the day or two or three days before so that the importance of that is is vital and and both the the rapid eye movement and the non-rapid eye movement stages of sleep um both have really different part, uh, important parts to play in our in our restoration and and i think until i I realized that it didn't occur to me how much was, was going on just whilst we were lying there, apparently doing nothing. Uh, and so the, uh, when I was younger, I used to take this sort of sleep is for wimps approach, you know, <clears throat> I'll get all the sleep I need when I'm dead. And I think one of the really interesting things is that from my experience, I only realized the effect of a good night's sleep once I started giving it to myself. And up until that stage, I thought I was doing fine. I thought I was functioning really well. And then when I started to, I did a little experiment after reading Why We Sleep by um, Professor Matthew Walker. It's a fantastic book. I gave myself a proper seven to eight hours sleep every night for a couple of weeks. And I realized that for a long, long time, even though I thought I was functioning quite well, I was actually chronically sleep deprived. And I suddenly found an extra 10, 20% in what, was, in what I was able to do in terms of my... Uh, professional life, my personal life, it made a, a huge difference. Have you, have you noticed in, in your own life times when you've either been doing really well or, or not so well? Yeah, no, I remember even a few years ago, I had a bit of a stressful period in my life just shortly after my mother died. 
and uh, I actually, it's really interesting. So uh, although I actually thought I was getting quantity wise good sleep, I started having um, episodes where I was, you know, I'm normally, I consider myself very, uh, my brain is being very active. Um, you know, I, my memory is, is certainly above average with things I remember, attention to detail, you know, I've got a mathematical brain. Um, and I found myself, um, you know, and, 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 and related to what I'm about to tell you, I, you know, I'm very, uh, you know, I love films. One of my passions is movies. And, you know, I, I, I remember names of films and actors and characters and all that kind of stuff. And I remember going to the cinema and I couldn't, um, you know, a trailer came up for a film. I can't remember which film it was actually at the time, but I couldn't, the face of Eddie Redmayne, the actor came up and I couldn't remember his name. And I thought, this is bizarre. And I found sporadically, I was forgetting, you know, even people, uh, the names of people I even worked with and that kind of thing. Anyway, long story short, I ended up speaking to somebody, a friend of mine who's a neurologist. Um, and she actually said to me, Asim, I think this is most likely you're not getting good quality sleep. And, uh, right. uh, and there's nothing else going on. And that's what you need to work on. I said, oh, that's interesting, because I've had a bit of stress going on. Anyway, circumstances changed. And I ended up getting better quality sleep. And, you know, this... This symptom, if you like, of me kind of not remembering, you know, recognizing faces of people that are well known that automatically should come to me. I mean, it would it would come to me eventually, but it might take an hour or half an hour, you know, half an hour, an hour for me to remember who they were. Uh, it, it, it resolved itself. But it took it took a couple of months. It took a couple of months, actually, before I suddenly mm. felt like, oh, everything's back to normal again. So I think that was one lesson I learned, certainly when it comes to sleep. I think um, I think the other thing we all know, Richard, when we've had a good night's sleep, how we feel during the day, you generally feel happier. Um, you're also less mm. likely to feel, res you, know, you respond to stress better, any external stresses, you know, anxiety, that kind of thing. So, um, uh, and when it comes to physical health, uh, Richard, we know that insulin resistance, which is at the root of many chronic diseases, heart disease, um, type 2 diabetes, probably uh, Alzheimer's and cancer as well to some degree, is influenced by making sure we get, you know, at least seven to eight hours of good quality sleep a night versus, mm. you know, getting less than five or six. And those changes can happen physiologically within just a few days of, of sleep deprivation. So, um, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it's a really big deal. Um, stress eating. Yeah. If, you don't, if, you don't, if you don't get a good night's sleep, you're more likely to go for those sort of dopamine enhancing comfort foods to try and lift yourself up. And, you, you know, there, are, there is data showing that People who don't have a good enough, you know, good seven hours of quad sleep a night end up consuming more calories during the day, usually from junk food. So mm. it's uh, it's crucial to everything. Absolutely. That that that. Do you think that explains my uh, uncontrollable uncontrollable desire for a sort of bacon butty first thing in the in the morning if I've uh, <laughs> possibly not had enough sleep and maybe a, a couple of drinks? Do you think that that could be yeah, behind absolutely. it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we know we know what it's like <laughs> in the morning. I mean, even that slightly sort of you know a late night on a Friday or being out or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you know that you're not going to get much sleep that day. You know, you come, whatever, if you come back at one, two in the morning or you're drinking with friends or whatever else, and then you wake yeah. up at the same time you normally wake up, you've had five hours sleep. Mm. And there is automatically, you know, you do feel when you wake up, you want to go for the sort of the, the, the high yeah. carbohydrate, um, mm. you know, meal, don't you? Your, your comments about the um, insulin resistance, I think, is, is really valid. Uh, I've seen patients who uh, were suffering from stress in their lives, uh, developed hypertension, perhaps some pre-diabetes. And when you chat to them, when I chatted to them, actually, in theory, they were ticking quite a lot of boxes. They were very physically active. They tried to practice a bit of sort of mental self-care, but their, their jobs were very stressful. Their days were very long. Um, they, they had a lot of stress at home, perhaps, and what, they were not sleeping very well. And I've seen people completely reverse their hypertension and their pre-diabetes almost through doing nothing other than just getting a better night's sleep, which, which is incredible, isn't it? Because, you know, the alternative is potentially a lifetime of, uh, of medication and yeah. doctor's appointments and, and the inevitable complications of, of those conditions. And yet just that simple restorative yeah. of getting a good night's sleep, free to all of us. Absolutely. I think the other thing as well, and, you know, it's something that is, uh, you know, you're reading more and more about uh, in the literature, and I'm seeing more and more patients with this issue, especially blokes, is the impact of sleep deprivation on testosterone. 
So, right. you know, um, erectile dysfunction, for example, is increasingly common in people over the age of 40. I think the statistics are 40 to 50%, 50 percent of men over 40 will experience erectile dysfunction at some point, significant erectile dysfunction. And, um, you know, obviously for, for a guy, you know, that for a man, you know, testosterone has so many roles to play in the body. It's not just about sex drive. It's about sense of well-being. It's about competitive drive. Um, mm. And uh, and sleep deprivation, just a few days of sleep deprivation can even crash someone's libido. So it's, you know, that's another incentive for people or people who might be suffering from are not realizing actually that is the, the key to them getting back to, you know, feeling that that vitality again. Uh, and improving their libido, etc., and sense of well-being is just making sure they focus on their sleep, and that may well be the most important factor when it comes to hormones like testosterone. Yeah. Well, then uh, we've we've had a good sort of conversation around quite a few of these topics. Uh, that one of the things that we try to do in this podcast is to really keep it practical uh, for people. So, l- should we talk about? Should we each give a few of our of our top tips then for yeah for a good night's Great sleep? I'd like to touch upon one to start with, which I think you've already mentioned, which is the importance of, of routine. You know, we know that our body clocks are, are roughly a, a 24 hour cycle. And um, I used to do this thing where I would wake up um, early in the mornings during the week, but I, I try to give myself a, um, a line at weekends. And I, and I didn't realize that sort of sleep deprivation during the week, trying to compensate for it on a Saturday and a Sunday didn't really work and I just ended up kind of jet lagged so one so my my first tip would be I, I encourage my, my patients and my colleagues to really try and roughly go to bed and get up at the same time each day of the week if they can give give or take you know obviously life can be a little bit different depending on yeah. your, your circumstances at weekends etc but I really recommend that and I think if people can anchor that with other bits that make the routine quite solid such as morning being also the time when they go for a walk or get do some other kind of physical activity then you're combining a regular sleep and wake time with physical activity and also um, light exposure so that really just kind of anchors that all together so my 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 top tip would be certainly a good routine um how about you yeah i completely agree with you richard i think the one thing i would add in especially these days uh, is become a major issue for many people and they don't even realize it i've got I won't name them, but certain relatives as well who I know are having their sleep, um, quality sleep uh, interfered with because they're addicted to social media. So we know that screen time, for example, certainly closer to bedtime is going to have an impact on your sleep quality. Um, it might even interfere with you going to sleep or it might you might be able to sleep, you know, fall asleep quite easily, but then wake up later on. So I, you know, recommend to my patients as well that you really you should try and um, be off from screens for at least one to two hours, ideally two to three hours if you can before bedtime. Um, getting off social media, getting off your phone, uh, keeping your mobile phone out of the bedroom. Uh, these are some. Th- th- I think it's a really important tip for people, and you can notice a big difference once you get into that habit of of saying, okay, I'm not going to be. The last thing I do before I go to bed is not going onto social media and, and looking at mm. whatever Twitter or Instagram or Facebook. Uh, that has been shown to have quite a big impact on sleep quality. Mm. And that, that that would be my other joint favourite uh, tip. I absolutely agree. You've beaten me to that one. I think it's not just the whole uh, blue white light and lowering our levels of melatonin, but it's also that um, activating our brains as we disappear down those those rabbit holes of. Yeah. Uh, of anxiety and the fear of missing out, etc. Yeah. Um, so, so I absolutely endorse that. I seem. I think that's fantastic. Another one that I tend to suggest to patients is talking about avoiding drugs that are going to disrupt your sleep. Yes. And for me, for me, the big two are, are caffeine and alcohol. Really. Yeah. So you know, we probably all know. I've got a friend who who could drink a double espresso an hour before he goes to bed and sleep like a baby, but but he's probably unusual. Yeah. So I recommend to people who are struggling. That they try to avoid their caffeine after midday. Yes, 100% ideally. I agree with you. Absolutely. Yeah, because because the half life of caffeine is six hours, so you've still effectively got a quarter in your body at midnight if yeah. you if you've had your cup at midday. And obviously, if you're sensitive to the acts of, of caffeine, um, that's an issue. And then the other one, of course, is alcohol, which I'm sure that you speak to your patients a lot about as well. Um, and we know that alcohol, although it's a sedative, it's not a it's not a restorative drug. Um, one of my 
a friend's wired me up once with a, a heart rate variability monitor to look at fitness and recovery. And I did a trial on myself. And the first night, I wore it for three or four nights. And the first night, I just drank no alcohol, no phones, went to bed at a sensible time. <clears throat> and the next night, I had a couple of drinks and looked at my phone for just 15 minutes. And the effect on the objectively measurable data overnight that showed how well I had recovered, or in the second night, not recovered, was staggering. It was really, really quite sobering. Um, so the combination so, uh, of the alcohol and looking at social media was a really... Oh, was, deadly. Okay, lethal, yeah. basically, when it comes to sleep. But I'm a pragmatist. You know, I enjoy a beer. Uh, I even enjoy a couple of beers sometimes. And uh, so one of the things I, I tend to recommend to my patients and to myself is that, you know, if, if I'm going to enjoy having a drink, I'll probably try and do it in the earlier part of the evening. Or perhaps when you come back from a... Um, if you're going to go out with your friends for the evening, maybe don't combine a couple of drinks with get, getting to bed at one in the morning because clearly you've then got a particularly toxic combination. Yeah, and I think the key uh, is about, you know, not, not making... I think that, you know, there are some people, you know, if your sleep is an issue, then it's about focusing on these specific things. So you can go through periods of your life, and I tell my patients where you're doing things that are your routine, you've slept fine, and then suddenly your sleep gets interrupted for whatever reason, whatever trigger then it's the time to then focus on those things that actually, okay, what, how much alcohol are you drinking? When are you drinking? How much caffeine are you, doing, uh, are you, are you consuming? Uh, and, and all of it interacts in the sense that if you've got, you know, for example, if patients that I see are suddenly having more stress in their lives, even though they may have been fine for years having two cups of coffee a day, I will say, listen, I, what I want you to do right now is reduce your caffeine intake because when you are stressed, Mm. caffeine makes it worse, right? You may have been fine three months ago, but right now you're going through a lot of stress and it's making it worse. So just focus on these little things. And actually, it's really interesting. They come back, you know, in a follow-up a few months later and say, you know, these things really helped, um, whatever it was. It just, it was, it made it easier for me to combat this problem by cutting out caffeine and reducing my alcohol intake. So absolutely. I think we've got to think about it also in a bit more of a nuanced way. Mm. That's a really helpful example, Asim. I think that reflects the fact that, life is complex and changes and the the people that we are changes as well as it Absolutely. were not very grammatical but you know what i mean change all the time our circumstances change yeah. yeah and the things that we once took for granted you know might change because of variable things including our age yes and everything well, else you know, that's you going mentioned on in earlier, i was thinking richard about the whole you know the catch-up sleep on the weekend i used to do that as well as a student right in my Never was a problem for me. I felt great. I could do that during the week and not sleep as much and then align on the weekend. Yeah. And I'm sure that, you know, there may be some small effects on the body, but in your 20s, it probably doesn't have that much of an effect. It's not that big a deal. But when you mm. get older, when you're plus mm. 40, you know, um, the body just changes. It's just part of the, it's, it's an unfortunate part of the aging process. But it's something I think we need to be, if anything, more proactive about these sorts of things as we get older. Um, of course, prevention is, is better than cure. But um, it, it, again, if people who are listening think, oh, I'm fine and, you know, I'm, I'm, you know wait till you hit 40. Um, yes. and, then, and then you'll see what happens to your body. And then you might have to think, make changes which were things that you just took for yeah. granted before are now a problem for you. Lessons that you and I have clearly both had to learn. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the last thing I wanted to mention, is Seema, and I'm sure that you and I have both seen this in our clinical practice, is, you know, we've talked about sleep hygiene tonight uh, and, and lifestyle and, and we, you know, we could talk about other things like keeping your bedroom cool and dark and making it a place you just go to sleep. But obviously one of the, one of the reasons that many people talk to me about sleep, and I'm sure you've seen this too, is actually because there, there are other things going on in their life which are causing that sleep to be disrupted. You know, they're not neglecting their, themselves as such, but typically mental health problems are a common example of that yeah and clearly uh, a person may be suffering from poor sleep because of that and so far we've talked about uh, you know the practical things that you can do to make those adjustments but as, as, as we begin to wind this up from your perspective how do how do you broach those conversations if you sense there's a could be an underlying mental health issue you know how do you talk to that about patients do you make any particular recommendations for example well Hey Richard, as you know, it's all based upon individual patients. And, you know, some of my patients, of course, are going to need extra help. I want to say extra help. You know, we're talking about lifestyle here and all these things are crucial, you know, to, to think about as you move forward. But people can get in situations that are so bad that they need medications. I'm talking about, you know, antidepressants, for example. 
Uh, mm. And if I pick up clinical depression or they develop true clinical depression where, you know, as you know, you've got these persistent symptoms for at least two weeks, you know, several different symptoms, often I will then give them a kickstart and say, listen, you've got to a situation which is quite bad. You need a medication. It will start to help you to feel better within two to three weeks. I still want you to focus on the lifestyle stuff, not to just take this as a substitute, but think about that. But it can it can have a massive impact on people. You know, and they can just stay on, as you know, Richard, you don't need to necessarily stay on for very long if you can ideally get them off it in three to six months once they've come out of that 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 deep, dark hole they've found themselves in. Um, so I think, it, it, again, it's individual based. When it comes to, you know, uh, other external factors, often people, when you explore it, I will ask them as part of my conversation, all my cardiac patients, you know, I, I talk about stress and sleep, but I will I will ask them about what is their, you know, how's their quality of, uh, how's, their, how's their personal life? How's their relationships? Mm. How's their family life going? What's going on at work? You know, I will explore that a little bit and they will often divulge it and suddenly they'll, you know, sometimes they'll, some people are very tearful and suddenly like, okay, you've, you've, you've hit a nerve there. It's something that's been brewing for a long time. I think it's our job as doctors to try and identify those root causes and even just sometimes having that conversation or them suddenly opening up to you as a doctor and, and something they've been hiding or not been, to, been able to talk about with anybody that in itself can be very therapeutic for patients. But it also then mm. least allows them to think a little bit more about, okay, I've got a situation because of this, this and this, you know, something with work. Is there something I can do to change those external circumstances? And obviously it's not easy to, to, to capture all of that or give people all the best solutions uh, within one consultation or conversation, but you can at least start that process. Absolutely. Um, really, really important, I think. And, and I would just recommend that anyone listening to this, if, if you think that your mental health could be a factor in affecting your sleep, you know, do, do talk to someone about it, whether it's um, your friends, your family or your doctor. And really important to have that, that conversation. Yeah. And I think, Richard, on that uh, as well, I think we need to say if this has been going for a long time with many people, you can get to a state of where actually despite you trying with your best efforts all these different things that we talk about your sleep is still in a bad way this often can indicate that th things are more significantly wrong in terms of the biochemistry of you know you've got to a point where your serotonin is depleted you're clinically depressed and you will need help you know all the advice we give you at that point may do nothing right at that point you know to help you you may well need medications and i think people should not be afraid to reach out and speak to, you know, uh, their GP or, or their healthcare practitioner about it, because, you know, that, that can make a big difference to getting you out of that hole. That's a really helpful note on which to finish. Asim, I, I've really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you very much for your time today. I hope that our, our listeners have also enjoyed it. Um, I'm sure we'll be speaking again soon. Um, but today, um, thank you for your time and uh, we'll speak soon. Thank you, Richard, my pleasure. Take care. You've been listening to Wellbeing for Real Life with me, Dr. Richard Pyle. If you've enjoyed this episode, please give it a nice review and tell other people about it. If you'd like to learn more, my book Fit for Purpose is out now, published by Harper Inspire and available in paperback, ebook, and audiobook. You can also follow me on Twitter, YouTube, and my website, wellbeingforreal.life. This podcast was recorded at Monkey Nut Audiobooks. Until next time, take care of yourself.